some of you simply will not be granted access at the gates of heaven because the responses that I received to a call that I put out for unpopular Taylor Swift opinions are frankly diabolical. They are crazy. Now, the lighting is a little dramatic today because I'm filming in the morning and this is just the way the sun comes through my windows, but I think that it necessarily gives me an angelic celestial hue of protection to protect me from the absolute fucking insanity that I'm about to show you all. So if you don't know me, my name is Zach. I am the Swiftologist. I'm a journalist by trade and a Swifty by choice. And I like to make thoughtful weekly videos about pop culture. If that sounds good to you. Like this video, leave a comment and subscribe. But today, instead of sharing my unpopular opinions with you, I'm going to be going through your unpopular opinions. Now I take a lot of heat in my comment section all the time for not being an absolutely delusional stan. I don't like to excessively, endlessly praise Taylor. I love her, I'm a fan, have been, I'm a veteran Swifty, long time, been to a secret session, yada, yada, yada. But I don't like to flatter her with praise 24 seven because sometimes she does some stupid shit. So I imagine my surprise when I ask you for your unpopular opinions and you guys ate her the fuck up. You ate Taylor Swift and each other all the way up. And I feel as though the criticism that I get in my comment section calling me a hater, not a real fan, blah, 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 should all be turned around, thrown back to you because this is crazy. This is very crazy. And I think I'm gonna have to do, I think at least two videos on this because there's just so much to get through here and so much of it was just uncalled for. Please forgive the lighting if it goes in and out throughout this video. I am filming in the morning, as I said, and I'm very excited for the month of December because I have so many fun videos coming up for you. I'm going to Tokyo. I'm going to be vlogging when I'm there. I know I say that all the time, but I'm actually going to do it. Anyway, 2016, the inevitable episode of The Evolution of a Snake, my Taylor Swift podcast, where we go year by year through the girl's career. That is finally coming out in the next week or so. So I really just want you guys to stay tuned and make sure to keep up with me on socials so that you can participate in things like sharing insane and popular opinions when I make a call, in fact, asking for them. So I'm not going to be reading anyone's usernames out because I don't want anyone to get harassed or doxxed for any of these accusations that they have made against Taylor Swift. Although some of you should like literally be sent to prison for some of the things that you sent. Uh, I'm going to give you some grace and not expose you in this video. So the first unpopular opinion that I want to share with you. Now, some of these I do agree with. That's the funny thing is that there are some completely insane ones and some ones that you think I would agree with that I don't. So let's go through them all and I'll share with you my thoughts on these unpopular opinions. One kind of overarching thought that I've had ever since going through these is that some of you don't know what an unpopular opinion is and a lot of you shared the same unpopular opinion. So either the Swiftologists all have like a hive mind and we're thinking outside of the box or you guys just don't know what an unpopular opinion is. But you know, that just remains to be seen. We'll just have to go through it and see who put what where and whether or not they're insane. Okay, first up, it's totally okay to listen to Taylor's stolen songs when the re-recorded ones sound worse. I totally agree with that. Not me going off for like two minutes about how everyone's crazy and going to jail. I actually agree that we should be able to listen to the stolen versions because there are some songs throughout Fearless and Red Taylor's version that just don't have the level of care and respect put into them that some of the other ones do. Like it's just such a mixed bag with the re-recordings and you never really know if you're going to get a really faithful reproduction or, you know, potentially even something that's better than the original. I would venture to say that the re-recorded version of Red Taylor's version is probably better than the original version to me, in my opinion. And so is Tell Me Why on Fearless. So those are two like ones that I will very gladly and happily listen to instead of the stolen versions. But there are other songs like our dearly beloved Holy Ground that just literally got treated like a pair of old dirty shoes that were thrown down the garbage chute. They like, it just wasn't, it was as though Taylor like listened to the song once, was like, eh, yeah, okay, I got it, I can do it. And did it in one take and really didn't think about it. And the production is so hit and miss. <laughs> and some songs kind of needed an update, I guess. Like Red has a very garish production that I think was modernized quite nicely in the Taylor's version. I can definitely see and make the case and admit that I 
frequently listen to the stolen versions, especially of like Holy Ground. Like I am not going to replace something that has been so important to me for so many years with something that's garbage. And also I don't really think that the point of the re-recordings is to entirely replace the masters. It is, this is literally a metaphor, which goes into another unpopular opinion. Taylor is greedy and the re-recordings are just an exercise in getting more money. Now listen, I could not disagree with that more because if you know anything about Taylor Swift, you know that yes, she is money hungry, but only in the sense that money is equal to power in this world. If we lived in an alternative universe and being poor was a power, Taylor would also want to be poor. She is really driven by, I think, having respect and getting one over on people who have wronged her. And the re-recording situation is a prime classic example of this because I really don't think that she's trying to get us to switch to the re-recorded versions entirely. I think she knows that a lot of us are going to stick with what we know and have loved for many years. And I think she herself still obviously has a huge emotional attachment to the masters what she's really doing is trying to make a point and point is being made whether or not we switch completely to the stolen versions is completely irrelevant at this point she even if she wanted to could stop with the re-recording process now because she has truly made her point like the entire music industry has acknowledged that she has the power and the capacity to do this um scooter braun is in shambles everybody hates him uh she's still continuing to go after him in her new original music that which reminds me we should really say our prayer i didn't say our prayer yet dear lord please ensure that scooter braun and scott borchetta have really terrible days and never have a day of rest in their life amen so i think that the re-recordings process is not even really about money at all i would say it's definitely more about clearing her name and also reclaiming her work which she totally like validly has a right to do and i think that the re-recording process is so fun and exciting and even if i like complain about a taylor's version i love getting to experience these albums all over again for the first time and i think it's a really good opportunity for the new stands who like to behave as though they're some sort of oppressed minority in my comment section <laughs> it's a good opportunity for them to kind of relive the lore and you know learn from the older swifties and hear from taylor more directly exactly what these albums meant to her and what kind of period of her life they marked because taylor is not really much of a retrospective artist i mean at least before the re-recordings process she didn't really talk about her albums that she had already released. She was very focused on like what's new, what's out now. A good example of this is how Speak Now pretty much got ignored for the following years after it was released. That's why it's exciting for albums like Speak Now to be re-recorded because it gets to have its moment in the sun. Do I trust that Taylor will give it the moment in the sun that it deserves? No, I don't. Hope is a dangerous thing for a Swiftie like me to have, but I have it. Okay, so clearly I think some of you were just trying to get on my fucking nerves because someone said, Cruel Summer is good, but not great. Getaway Car came first and is better. And I got so many unpopular opinions about Cruel Summer. And it's like, I went through the 12 stages of grief. How many stages of grief are there? 12, I went through anger, denial, bargaining. Maybe you didn't listen to the Cruel Summer I heard. Maybe you're talking about a different Cruel Summer. Maybe you just can't hear correctly. I really was trying hard to understand where you all were coming from, but it's like, it's unfortunately just a fact of life that Cruel Summer is one of the best songs of all time ever in the history of the world, let alone in Taylor Swift's discography. So I said, I just can't accept that. That's not an unpopular opinion. That's a wrong opinion. This one, I was like a little, being a little bit more gentle with because it seems as though this person acknowledges the greatness of Cruel Summer, but just thinks that Getaway Car is better. And Getaway Car is good. I really like Getaway Car. It's one of my favorite Taylor songs, but like, it's not what you guys think it is. Getaway Car is like, I, a lot of people say she's underrated, but all I ever hear is Getaway Car this, Getaway Car that. And like, yeah, it's good. It's a metaphor. Cruel Summer is a religion. Cruel Summer is the truth. Cruel Summer is the Bible. So if you don't understand that, then you need to find God. Okay, up next, you should not be allowed to say the words, my flight was awful, thanks for asking in a song if you fly via private jet. I mean, T. Taylor really at this point, I mean, she wrote that lyric and put it on an album after we had already had all the private plane discourse and Tree Pain came out with that absolutely ridiculous rebuttal that Taylor shares her private plane with others. How generous of her, but I agree with you. This is not unpopular. This is also, you know, true fact. August is great, but it by no means deserves to be the biggest song on folklore at this point. It's probably in my bottom five on the album. I kind of agree with that. I mean, I never thought that August was all that great to begin with. It's cute. It's like a little bit of a banger and a bop, but like there isn't much substance to it. I think it really does kind of capture that like summer 
love teen fling kind of thing and folklore really was an album that yielded her a lot of new fans and a lot of younger fans as well and if you think about albums like folklore and evermore there aren't a lot of like immediately accessible songs that are like very obviously and plainly about one specific thing or one emotion and i think that that's why songs like august and champagne problems which are not like really are not the best songs on each of their records have so much like adoring praise behind them because they have a very uh, explicit and obvious emotional pull towards them there are certain songs that take a little bit longer to understand peace is a really good example of that uh, mirror ball is also very much more complicated has its fans but it's not it doesn't have the august reputation cowboy like me ivy evermore the song i mean there are a lot of more complex intricate interesting songs to consider here and i think that some people are just kind of stupid and taylor's fan base has grown like so big that it's important that she has songs that kind of appeal to the lowest common denominator and i think august and champagne problems in my opinion are the lowest common denominators on folklore and evermore sorry the era's tour is premature she should just be touring midnights first now this is interesting to me and i kind of agree and the reason why I agree is because I think that I wanted all of the re-recordings to be done before she goes on the era's tour. And I was really loving the kind of slow pace we were getting them at. I don't want them all at once. I'm really enjoying getting to relive them for the first time again. And that's an experience that I'm only ever gonna get to have once. So if the idea is to complete all of the albums before she goes on tour, which I, it seems to me that's what she's gonna do for the era's tour, then that means that all of the re-recordings pretty much have to come out in their entirety in the next couple of months. I don't really want that to happen. And also I kind of would like to have a deep cut tour. If you saw my ideal set list for the era's tour, it's very much all over the place. But even still, because I had to accommodate Midnight's within that set list, I really just don't think that the the full body of work really gets its chance to shine. And also Midnight's is a really interesting and like fun album. And I could definitely see it being, it's long enough to be a tour in and of itself. But I also can't imagine her doing a stadium tour and not playing Love Story and like not playing You Belong With Me or, you know, any of the fucking massive hits that we want to hear. And Lover is really, as much as I don't like it, needs to have its moment in the sun. There are a couple of songs that really need to get played live. Cruel Summer being number one. So I can kind of see where you're coming from with this, but also I don't know how much touring Taylor has left in her, at least on this scale. And logistically touring has gotten so, so complicated in the last couple of years or so. Lord actually sent out an email explaining the logistics of touring and how difficult it is, like supply chain wise, transporting equipment, booking venues, like hiring crews, the still unpredictability of that thing that's going around in the world. So I think that honestly, it seems as though she is going to take some time off maybe after this. I think she's still gonna be creating and putting stuff out and uh, releasing music videos, but I think that touring at least is something that she cannot be doing consistently on a two year basis for a long period of time. It's just not, I don't think it's feasible for her at this point in her life. Like she needs to exist outside of having her life planned in two year intervals. We saw that in Miss Americana. She got a taste of it during the pandemic and I feel like she wants to bash this out and do as many big shows as possible and then, you know, chill and not have people like scrambling down her neck. This lighting is all over the place, but I'm kind of living for it. Midnight's is not even in the top of her best albums. It has too many skips and mid-tier songs. To me, it's just a tad bit better than Lover. Some really good bops and the rest is just okay. That is so interesting to me. I don't even necessarily disagree with that. I think it's hard to compare Midnight's to the other albums in the discography because I have not lived with it for very long. I've only had it for, you know, what, a month at this point. But I will say that like there are only six, maybe seven songs that I come back to on a regular basis. And there is a lot of filler. Now it's not necess it's not lover filler to me in that it's like, I don't wanna listen to it. If it comes on shuffle, I won't immediately click off most of the songs, but I don't actively proactively go out and seek the songs from this album because I don't know. I don't know what it is. I feel like maybe I've just overplayed it way too much at the beginning and I need to give it some time to settle in so I can reform my opinions about it. For me, it's certainly not one of my favorite Taylor Swift albums, nor do I think it's one of her best works. I still think that it's great. And I think that there are some really interesting, unique and specific things about it that are, you know, not present in the rest of her discography. 
But I also think that she has had better pop albums and she's had better writing elsewhere. To me, it's definitely better than Lover, but I wouldn't say that it's better than some of her other pop albums like 1989 or even Reputation. Dear John is too long, it drags. Do you understand that the words that you speak into this world have consequences and those consequences are hurting my feelings and being factually incorrect. This unpopular opinion actually reminds me of another unpopular opinion that I got sent in, which was about the last time someone wrote in and said that they thought this was one of her best collaborations ever and that it really just doesn't get its moment in the sun because it's like very long and people don't understand how it swells and like the harmonies. And that's true. And I'm bringing that up in relation to Dear John because I have this feeling that younger stands, newer people around the block are not consuming music in the same way anymore. Like our general approach to music is so different now than what it was when an album like Speak Now and a song like Dear John came out in the first place. I was at a writing panel yesterday for the Singapore Writers Festival and something that one of the authors talked about was how writers need to adapt to their readers' attention spans and our attention spans are just getting collectively lower and lower and, and you need to be more upfront and grab the reader instantly. For pop music, I think that our attention span has like sunk to a criminally low level and because of that, people just don't get the earlier songs in the discography when they go back and listen to them. They, they think that they drag too long or that they don't make sense. But like Dear John is truly an excellent song. And the fact that it's long and winding and it feels like a very long, sad dream is kind of the point of the song. And the last time as well is one of those songs that is a slow build. But when you get to that crescendo, it is so hard won and so well like swelled up to that it becomes something different to anything Taylor Swift has ever done before. So those songs I think don't resonate with new fans because their attention span and the way that they interact with and consume music is different. Now, I don't think that that, I don't think that it's impossible to consider these songs for their excellence if you are a new fan. I just think that it's harder to. And I think that if you were around from the beginning and you listen to more music and have been listening to music for longer and you have like other artists as reference points, those songs don't seem like dragging long or uh, too, too slow songs. It's, I don't think that a song always needs to slap you in the face within the first 30 seconds of you listening to it for it to be a very worthy, understandably good song. So my response to if you think Dear John is too long is you don't get it. Uh, unfortunately, you just don't get it. It's not for you. Girl at Home is good and underrated as fucking hell. I agree. I love Girl at Home. Now is Girl at Home a good song? I think we have to be honest with ourselves here. I love it. It's a banger. It's a bop. It's iconic. The new version sucks. But is it really good is it like objectively a great song i would say probably not and i think that if you were being honest with yourself person who sent this in you know that that's true beautiful ghosts yes from that god-awful movie cats is actually a spectacular song um beautiful ghosts you mean taylor's like fake british song that she wrote where she's singing in this bizarre english musical theater voice the entire time that is sung in a movie where people are wearing digital fur i mean beloved you need to get your taste buds checked. The commercial success of Midnight's may prevent Taylor from being more creatively adventurous in the future. I just don't think that that's true. Like, what's the basis for saying that? I mean, after 1989, which was arguably her most like impactful, insane, like overthought pop album, she still went on to do Reputation and Folklore and Evermore. So I just, I don't, I don't see that. Taylor's creative adventurousness, I think, is something that she's actually only just kind of scratching the surface of getting into. And if you really listen to Midnight's, there are a lot of like new threads and things like style and sonic interesting threads that she has not discovered before that are, I think, only just coming to fruition. So I think that the pop-ish songs on Evermore and also the pop stuff on Midnight's is definitely leading her in a new direction that is creative and adventurous. I think that she will continue to be creative and adventurous. And I also think that she's absolutely uninhibited by form at this point, which is super exciting. So I, yeah, the re-recordings has also been a super creatively inspired project. So I don't really get where that's coming from. That is a stupid opinion. Other celebrities kiss up to Taylor in the media because she's so successful and they're scared of her. Again, that's not an unpopular opinion. That's, them's the facts, that's the rules. That is the lay of the land. It is a really stupid idea to go up against Taylor Swift. And it was like this in the 1989 era where anybody who said anything even slightly critical or negative about her got eaten the fuck up. And we all know how that went, right? And I think that at a certain point, when you become Taylor's level of famous, your 
uh, reputation, the way that you are perceived, the way that people will respond to you being perceived is completely out of your hands. And it actually doesn't matter how you respond or what you say because it is uh, beyond you now. Like Taylor to us is not Taylor. Taylor is Taylor Swift. She is a figure, an artist that people project their like different things onto. And this also leads me to another unpopular opinion, which was that it's really unfair how the ex-boyfriends get treated in the media when the re-recordings are coming out, specifically citing Jake Gyllenhaal and expressing concern for John Mayer. First of all, fuck John Mayer. There's no concern for John Mayer. Everything bad that has happened to him, he deserves. It's not just what he's done to Taylor. He has a history of treating women terribly and being a douchebag with an overinflated ego. So like whatever karmic retribution comes his way, he deserves. The idea of the Swifties being a pack that Taylor can either unleash or call off is kind of stupid. She can get us riled up and request us to go and do something, but what she is not able to do is call it off. And if she was able to, you know, rein in the army, don't you think that she would extend that to her own private life first? So if these are constantly doing invasive shit that I am very sure bothers Taylor and annoys her and embarrasses her and makes her feel like a monster on the hill around all these sexy babies, like just this unbeatable force going back to our celebs scared of her. Yes, they are. And this is why there is no point in trying to call off the hounds. You can't, you literally can't do that. Whatever Taylor does, if Taylor expresses that she has been hurt, the Swifties are gonna go after the people that hurt her. The only solution to that would be to stop being creative in that way and to stop talking about her feelings. You could make the argument that she needs to be less obvious in her songs about who she's writing about, but then that kind of defeats the whole purpose and interferes with the creative process to prevent a hypothetical attack of someone who probably did something mean to her. I mean, she's an artist, right? Like, I just don't think that that is a good enough reason. And I also don't think that any of these people that are like getting their just desserts are people who are A, unable to deal with it or B, not deserving of it. So as Taylor Swift said in the Fearless tour, if you don't want me to write bad songs about you, you shouldn't do bad things. Taylor should stop directing her music videos. She's not very good at it. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more with you. I hate the music videos that she self-directs. Hate is a strong word because I liked most of the Midnight's music videos, but I think that Taylor has so many ideas. And this goes back to something I say a lot of her as a songwriter. She has so many ideas that she really needs help to distill them into a cohesive and coherent final product. And a director, when it comes to a visual sense, literally has that job for her. I think Taylor is best in the music video arena when she's working with the storyboards and she's being collaborative. When she has full reins to decide the entire flow of a music video, we get something like The Man, or we get something like Bejeweled. And like Bejeweled, I like it because she looks good in it and she's serving, but does it express anything about the song? No. Does it tell any story that is interesting in the dialogue? Absolutely not. The anti-hero dialogue is also similarly useless. Like they're just little skits thrown in with famous people in them. It's very like the Bad Blood music video where she just kind of shoehorned a bunch of famous people in for promo, but she doesn't need to be doing that anymore. She can generate enough conversation about a music video simply by making one. And I would like to see her stick through with a consistent, like clear idea of a story. Did she direct the Cardigan and Willow music videos? I think that she did. And both of those were pretty good music videos that had really interesting songs. I loved the piano time travel thing in Cardigan and I loved the invisible string going through Willow. Those were really cute, interesting, meaningful Easter egg-ish videos that did not veer into ridiculousness. And the Midnight's music videos, I like Antihero. If there was no dialogue in it, I would think it was a much better music video than it was. And speaking of the Antihero music video, someone said, I think that it's good that she edited the word fat out of the Antihero music video because it's not a bad thing to be more inclusive. Now, I don't agree. <laughs> I don't agree because I think that that video is about Taylor grappling with like her innermost demons and insecurities, I guess, and looking on the scale and having her inner critic tell her that she is too fat. The point is not that she is like hating fat people or that she is um, being fat phobic, I suppose. The point is that her inner critic is so harsh that it doesn't matter what number comes up on the scale. The word fat is a stand in for any other critical thing that she has said or thought about herself. It's showing us that she has the inclination to overreact and to not perceive reality as real because she's constantly being so hypercritical of herself. And I just, I really don't think that it is more inclusive to not say that. I think it's pretty dishonest actually. Like she was being pretty like vulnerable and saying and showing us one of her innermost neuroses 
and because it wasn't woke or it wasn't like because someone on twitter decided that it wasn't woke it then has to be edited out of the music video and i just don't think there was any productive conversation had about that it was just a bunch of people being like you are being fat phobic and you are shaming people for being fat and that is absolutely not what was happening in that music video at all it was there to illustrate and serve a purpose and it also you know addresses something that taylor has talked about before which is her struggle with her body image and i think that policing whether she can say that or not in her own art is kind of messed up and i don't think that's very inclusive at all i really don't like this trend of uh the woke mob forcing artists to take stuff out of their work i really think that that is a truly atrocious way to approach creative work and I also think that it stifles creativity um, just because you don't agree with something or you find it offensive or even in fact if it is offensive it is art and the purpose of art is not to make the world a better place art has a purpose in and of itself which is to be art to be creative to be an expression to be something that you know goes for a higher ideal than good bad it's supposed to be kind of an otherworldly experience and it needs to exist in a realm where it's free from our, our like very silly inane and ever oscillating and fluctuating standards of what's morally reprehensible or not so i don't agree with you on that bleachella wasn't that bad aesthetically girl i agree that's not an unpopular opinion i'm with you <laughs> i agree i believe you i'm right there with you hiddle swift was really iconic the outfits the hair i mean it was hit and miss but she was taking risks she was having adventures she was uh not holding back on the creative elements of this production and i loved bleachella honestly in hindsight i mean maybe at the time i was so overwhelmed and checked out and there were so many negative voices coming at me about taylor that i was maybe kind of wishing that she would lay low for a while but in hindsight i'm glad that she didn't lay low because it was wake up serve slay every day i don't know who i am but you know i'll find it eventually and right now i'm just gonna work it out the first time i heard all too well 10 i was disappointed because the production made it seem insincere and took away from the emotional value I 100% agree. I really want Jack Antonoff to get his dirty little paws off of the Taylor's versions because he just doesn't get it. Like what he did to Don't You on Fearless. How in the fucking world are you working on the Fearless project? Have you heard the album before? Have you listened to it? Because there is literally nothing on Fearless that sounds anything like Don't You. And what he did to the all too well 10 minute version was Jack Antonoff it. And that's not the aim of this project. The aim of this project is that we are literally going back into the canon and kind of making little final tweaks. But those tweaks cannot be additions with a new perspective or like your opinion of what music should be. There is an all too well 10 minute version with the original 2012 production production on YouTube. I recommend that you go and listen to it. That's the only one that I listen to now. It's so muted and it doesn't have as many live instruments and it feels very like, I don't know. I just, I really was not appreciative of the work that he did on that. I wish that Aaron Dessner had taken a go instead. Even the vocal takes are filtered in this very Jack Antonoff way that is not representative of how the actual song sounded in the first place. So I agree with you. I want Jack Antonoff to take a step back from the vault tracks and leave them alone. And another unpopular opinion that I got, I'm not kidding, like 50 times in this response was Jack Antonoff needs to stop working with Taylor. She needs to work with someone else and try something new. Like, yes, besties, we all know that. That's not an unpopular opinion. Everybody has been saying that since Midnight's came out. I hope that she will branch out. I, in general, really like the work that she does with Jack Antonoff. I'm not opposed to having him on the next album, whatever that would be. I just want her to invite more producers into the fold. And I think that the most interesting songs on this album, Sonically, Lavender Haze, Karma, Glitch, those were all with other production teams. So can we branch out? Can we see? Why do we have to stick to one producer per record? I think it's interesting when we have multiple producers involved. Red is her most diverse album, Sonically, because it has the greatest number of producers on it like the most varied mixed bag of people on it and you know it has its highs and its lows but i really think that if we went back to taylor trying out different things under the idea of having like an overall cohesive message or theme like midnight's midnight's would have been a perfect opportunity to invite other producers into the fold i just think that there's definitely more to go more to explore with this and i'm excited to see that but not hopeful she seems really obsessed with jack antonoff and that bleachers remix of anti-hero is one of the worst fucking things i've ever heard in my entire life it is seriously appallingly bad if lover had different producers it would be at the top of everyone's album rankings okay so what you're saying is if lover was a different album if it was not the album that it is it would be at the top of everyone's rankings you could say that about any fucking album if debut had different producers it would be at the top of the album ranking if your point here is that lover is like secretly a really great album that people are somehow sleeping on you're wrong if she worked with different producers they would be different songs and those songs don't exist so 
you're wrong. She sacrifices art for commercialism too often and it's backfired. Weird singles, music videos, Joseph Kahn during the rep era was no. Okay, I don't really, this is a weird point. The Joseph Kahn music videos during the rep era, he gave us Look What You Made Me Do, which is potentially the most iconic Taylor Swift visual of all time. So I don't think that the argument that commercialism impends creativity extends to that specific project or even to Joseph Kahn in general. The videos that he's worked with Taylor on, I'm not his number one fan, but the videos that he's worked with Taylor on are some of the most iconic visuals in her entire career. Blank space. So yeah, I don't really agree with that. Also sacrificing art for commercialism. I think that Taylor comes at things from an art first perspective. And then as soon as the art perspective is done, she works really hard over time to, to try and see how she can make it as commercial as possible. And part of Taylor's art is being commercial. Like part of the thing that is interesting and inspiring about her art is that it reaches so many people. And the only way that it reaches so many people is because she is able to sell it widely and have many people in different markets be interested in it. So I think that Taylor's art and commercialism really work in tandem and can't actually be separated from each other at a certain point. Now, where commercialism, I think, gets in the way with Taylor maybe is these incessant remixes that she's putting out. Like, please stop. That's really diluting the value of the original song. The anti-hero remixes are completely ridiculous and many of them are like not value adds. So it's a very transparent money grab most of the time. And also her seemingly incessant need to put out a hundred million different various designs of hideous t-shirts every single day. That is kind of annoying, but that doesn't dilute the art. It just kind of makes, it just kind of leaves a bad taste in your mouth. So I'm gonna disagree with this one. Maroon is monotone and not as good as everyone is acting like it is. I can kind of see what you're saying here in that Maroon is a very sparse song. There's a lot of negative space in it and it feels a little lazy. I really like it and I think that the chorus is beautiful, but the verses just are kind of like a bit warbling and a bit one note. And I have this problem with what it could have should have as well. It's like the bridge and the chorus are really good in Maroon and in what it could have should have, but the verses just kind of don't uh, really contribute or extend to the rest of the song. And I think that this is Taylor being very hook focused and she has the potential to be very melody focused. Like Blank Space as a song is really interesting because it's catchy and captivating from the first line. Nice to meet you, where you been? The cadence, the up and down, like the up talk, the down talk is very interesting. And on this album, Karma, this is again why I think she is in desperate need of an editor because she has these amazing like hooks and melodies for the chorus. Karma is a good example of this that really could be elevated by having a little bit more diversity or attention paid to the sonic landscape of the verses. So I see where you're coming from on this with Maroon, but I love Maroon. So I don't think that it's bad. 50% of Taylor's comments on fan TikToks make no sense. I can tell you why that is. That's because she's not leaving them. That's my hot take, sorry about it. I have had this feeling since Taylor has been on Tumblr that it is not always her that is liking things and commenting on things. I just don't think she's that interested. I really don't think that she's that interested in TikTok. I don't think she has the temperature of the room. She doesn't know what's going on. Also, social media is such a toxic place for her to be. And like algorithmically, TikTok would show her some really fucked up shit. You know, like the galers are really huge on TikTok and I can guarantee you that that content pisses her off. So I don't think that she's scrolling through her FYP and liking and commenting on everything. I think she probably has a Taylor Nation stand in doing some of that at the very least and if not taylor nation are sending her specific tiktoks for her to look at she's not finding them herself so that's my opinion on why her tiktok comments sometimes make no sense because she's not even watching them all the way through if she is watching them at all reputation is very dated and weird when you have lived with it for five years some of the production is dated there are songs like end game and this is why we can't have nice things i don't think it aged very well but I don't think that it's to the point where it's completely unlistenable, especially not five years later. I think the time when it sounded most outdated was maybe two or three years ago, but now it's kind of like a time capsule. It's like a relic, you know? It doesn't need to be completely like modern as of right now. It's certainly not a timeless album, I will give you that. But I just don't think that it's that all that dated that it's like somehow become worse over the years. If anything, I feel like I've started to like Reputation a lot more. And I think that it's actually one of her most cohesive albums. And that's a response to another unpopular opinion I got, which is that Reputation is not cohesive at all. It's her least cohesive album, which I really don't understand because Reputation has a vibe that permeates the entire track list, even up to including New Year's Day. Well, probably not including New Year's Day, but everything before it kind of shares this similar sparse, um, anemic production style or this extremely bombastic, robotic, synthetic 
um, concoction. So I think that Reputation sonically is, you know, very similar to 1989 and that it has a cohesive sound that runs all the way through it that unites all of the songs together. The way Taylor Swift performs pop music actively aggravates me. The overly rehearsed looks and gestures and hand twirls and hip poses are so offensive to me. She is great when playing an instrument. That is so stupid. <laughs> I love her poses, her hands on hips, her pointing. She comes across very studied and I find that very endearing and very charming and very effective. It works on me. Like when I see her doing it, I just think that it's the absolute slay of the century. And this is why I love the 1989 tour film so much because she's so obviously like perfected every last strut and point and look and glance. And to me, that's just like, she has this command over herself for an hour and a half on stage. Like everything looks like it was perfectly placed and practiced a million times. To me, that's a level of dedication and focus and commitment to the bit that I just think is so endearing and like funny, but also iconic. Like I love the struts. I love the overly rehearsed looks. I love the surprised face. Like give it to me, I love it all. Question Vigilante Shit and Bejeweled is a very weak track run and all three songs could be replaced with any 3AM tracks. The 3AM tracks are not what you guys think that they are. There's like three or four really good ones and the rest of them are bonus tracks for a reason. And I keep seeing people saying that songs like The Great War and Paris should be on the standard edition of Midnight, but like they don't fall under the idea of like the Midnight's phone call conceit that we got in the first place. Now I will concede that some of the standard edition tracklist stuff also doesn't follow that, but like question not needing to be on the Midnight's thing. That is, I can't, like, I can't even begin to explain why that is such a wrong presumption. What would you put there instead? The Great War, Paris, those aren't Midnight songs. They're just like, there are ever more pop rejects. That's what they really are. And you know, I think you just don't get it. I think you don't get it. Sorry. Taylor has every right to be upset when people discredit her songwriting skills. I don't care how good or bad anyone thinks it is. She sits and writes every one of them. And I'd be pissed if people kept denying that at this point in my career. Totally agree. Uh, Taylor Swift's songwriting prowess is unmatched and has been independently confirmed by so many of her collaborators at this point that it's literally like conspiracy theory level of delusion to deny that she writes her own songs. So yeah, totally agree that she should take her shots when and wherever she sees fit, specifically when it comes to people trying to discredit her accomplished songwriting. Getting rid of meet and greets wouldn't be a bad thing. People could actually go to the shows and relax and enjoy instead of constantly wondering about how they look and if they're going to get picked. That is so interesting. And I know firsthand from many of my friends, including my co-host of The Evolution of a Snake, Madeline, that when you go to a show all dressed up, doing your absolute all going hard and wishing that you're gonna get picked for whatever the backstage meet and greet random Andrea selection thing is gonna be that night, it is crushing when you don't get it because you like manifest it, you delude yourself into thinking that you're gonna get it. But like specifically when it comes to the stadium tours, you really need to think about your odds and your chances of getting picked. Like if there are 80,000 people there and 40 people get to go and meet her, like Google the percentage of your odds. It's extremely low. Also picking people from the crowd and bringing them backstage is lore. Like that's been going on since the very first tour. So I think that it should continue, especially because it gives people that don't have a social media presence or like a following a chance to get noticed by Taylor. Like it gives casual fans as well, a chance to meet Taylor. You know, not all of us are super involved in the Stan online community and some of us who are, are not as well versed in the discography as people who don't participate in it at all online and just instead have a very like deep personal relationship to Taylor's music. So I actually think that like having the meet and greets after the show is kind of an essential purpose and function of the show. If she's doing meet and greets, what I think we need to do is stop being delusional and convincing ourselves that if you try hard enough, you will get it. I think everybody needs to go into a show with the presumption they're not going to meet Taylor. And if they do, it's an added bonus because otherwise it like ruins your whole show experience. So. Um, I think that's a personal problem that you need to take on. Taylor can't help you with delusions. You have to undelude yourself. Oh my God, this is the worst one. Speak Now is overrated in the fandom and has too many bad songs. Mine isn't even good. Better Than Revenge is not that good. And Feminism Off Better Than Revenge On is cringe. It's not a misery business slut shaming slay. To you, to you. It's not a misery business slut shaming slay to you, but to millions of people around the world in every continent, we are turning feminism off and putting better than revenge on. And if you don't understand that, then that's your problem. I'm so sad for you that you don't get it. To say that mine is not a good song is like just such a fucking insane out of pocket thing to say. And to say that Speak Now is overrated is actually fucking mental. Like that is mental because Speak Now is the most underrated Taylor Swift album, period. 
all of you evermore bitches are constantly talking about how underrated it is and every day i see people saying that they say it every single day if every day i'm seeing people saying that a certain album is underrated and going fucking insane and sicko mode at it anytime taylor does anything it's like where's evermore or this song is gonna get paid dust like evermore you know what that album hasn't even been out for two years yet and it cannot possibly be underrated when it hasn't even had the chance to be rated in the first place wait and see what's going to happen on the midnight's tour then you can call it underrated speak now has been criminally underrated since it came out it got its moment in the era and ever since it is slandered on the tl constantly because there are a bunch of new stands and i guarantee you the person who submitted this is under the age of 18 and was not around when speak now came out in the first place and also their favorite album is probably lover i guarantee you that is the perspective that this person has speak now is criminally underrated overlooked constantly by taylor all the time y you are just evil you're an evil little swifty she should work on her singing skills. The way she sings middle to high notes is not healthy and has damaged her voice a lot. You can notice that since the rap tour. Her not caring about it is blatantly stupid to me. Um, how can you notice that since the rap tour? She really hasn't done a lot of live performances and her folklore long pond studio session was some of her best vocals ever. She has a really interesting command of her falsetto and her lower register is really coming into this very healthy, um, low, interesting, rich and beautiful place. So I think her voice has changed for sure, but it has certainly has not gotten worse. <laughs> it has only gotten better. You want to hear bad? Go and look at her 2010 Grammys performance. Like to me, there is no bad Taylor vocal anymore because it has only gotten better. If it ever gets worse, like I'll let you know, but it hasn't. A punk sound would be awful for Taylor. She's just not a bad bitch. This is so true. And this is another thing that I got, an unpopular opinion. Some people, again, don't understand what an unpopular opinion is. Some people were saying, oh, Taylor needs to do a rock album. That's my unpopular opinion. People have been saying that ever since Lover came out. Actually, people have been saying that since she put out State of Grace and Holy Ground on Red. Everybody wanted a album with more of the same of that, if not like more intense. Taylor doesn't have the voice to do that kind of performance that would be required from a real pop rock album. Also, her writing is not suited to that genre at all. It's really not like that. That genre is definitely more about performance rather than substance in that you can have OK lyrics, but if they are delivered in an extremely emotive way, it elevates the song. Taylor is not capable of giving a vocal delivery in that genre. And also, I think that her writing would not translate to it. So... The pop rock Taylor Swift album would have to be a very specific thing. It would have to be more pop than rock, basically, for it to be successful. So, mm. all right. So this has already been so long. So I'm going to wrap it up with this and I'm going to keep going. I'm going to film another video right after this going through your unpopular opinions. But the last one is I prefer the original version of Untouchable to her cover. That tells me that you are sick in the head and that you need to seek professional help immediately. Also, or that you're just like completely insane and happy being so. The original version of Untouchable is like screaming. It's like a screaming song. It's awful. It's like a bunch of old men singing. Why would you want to hear that instead of the beautiful arrangement, delicate twinkling version, this night is sparkling version that Taylor came up with? All right, Swifties, that's all I have for you for this video. Sorry that the lighting was literally all over the place. I will see you in my next one and stay tuned because I have so much content coming for you in December and I hope that you have a wonderful week. Goodbye.